Next speaker is Camila Ahmedjanova from the University of Oxford, and the title of her talk is Double Past Participle Forms in the Sicilian Dialects. Please. Hello. Uh, one second, I'll start sharing the screen um, so that I can. Is it sharing now? Sorry, is it sharing now? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. So um, I will start my presentation then in this case, and the title of my talk is the... Yeah, but, uh, sorry, sorry, Camila, I, I think you'd better um, put it uh, the, on the full, full screen, screen mode, mode, please. Yes. What do I need to do? Press F5. I guess it will work. What should I do? Put the put your presentation in the full screen mode. Ah, okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. One second. Oh. One second. Sorry. Oh, it's no, okay. It's maybe, maybe it's somewhere slideshow. in in the slideshow. Oh, where is it? Slideshow and slideshow uh, top panel, no no lower, oh, lower yeah. orange uh, slideshow uh -huh. and then presenter view. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Oh, no. <laughs> so um, the topic of my presentation now is also the topic of my unfilled dissertation, <laughs> which was the double past participle forms in the Sicilian dialects. It's one of the phenomena that is very widespread in some Romance varieties, such as Sicilian and, for, for instance, Portuguese and Spanish as well. So. It's the phenomenon when one verb has two corresponding past participle forms rather than just one. So um, now I'll go further into this. But Sorry, first, I, I very much, I very much beg your pardon, but uh, uh, it, it, it is wrong. Please, could you please make your presentation full screen so that everyone sees everything clearly? Just so it's still slide. not. No, it's wrong. Pavel told you something wrong. Yes, use slideshow. Uh, use slideshow, please. Yeah, I did that. No, no, no. It, it's no. Uh, no, 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 not there. it's presenter view. Uh, on the red, uh, on the red panel, I guess. No. Okay. Yeah, let's red wait. panel slideshow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is Play it still the present? For example. Okay. Is it better now? Yeah, yeah, it's yes. perfect. Okay, <laughs> Thank Sorry you. about that. Okay, <laughs> so I will start with the defining past participle as such. And the question here arises because we don't really know whether we attribute, um, the, whether we classify the past participle as such into the verbal or adjectival class because we have, they have properties of both classes. So for instance, in the Oxford Dictionary of English Grammar, it is defined as the form of the verb which is used, um, okay, so in the Oxford Dictionary of the English Grammar is defined as the form of a verb which is used in passive and perfect constructions and sometimes in front of nouns, so it is defined as a verb, but is it really a verb? That's a good question because sometimes it just um, carries the adjectival functions um, and that's precisely the point of having two post participle forms in some varieties because I mean, from what I found out in my research and from what other researchers have found before me, um, it seems that whenever there are two uh, past participle forms found in one dialect or in one variety, one is um, used in adjectival context, is preferred in the adjectival context, and the other one is preferred in the verbal context. Um, so that makes us think that there exists a fundamental difference between verbal and adjectival characteristics of the past participle. Okay. Now, um, so what I implemented in my research, um, it was the morphomic approach, uh, which was outlined by Aronoff first uh, with his concept of a morphome, um, which he defined as, um, as a function that has a it has two different types of function with an identical form used in both cases. So for instance, an example of a morphone that Aronoff used himself was uh, English past participle. 
because um, the same form is used in both passive constructions and the perfrastic perfect tense forms. Um, in other words, um, present perfect, for example, uh, we use the same form, for example, it is done and I have done, the past participle form done is the same, but the function is different. Um, another, uh, another example of the uh, morphem that Aronov cited in his work was Latin third stem, which is um, also unpredictably variable in form, but consistently associated with an abstract and heterogeneous pattern of distribution. Um, we all know that Roman's post participle forms as such are the result of the development of Latin post participles. Um, and then also, uh, normally, Roman's post participles um, are Roman's varieties use one post participle form to express different functions. That's the normal situation, which we find in standard Italian with a very few exceptions. Um, we, for example, uh, the verb vedere would use two post participle forms, but that's an exception. That's not the rule. We have we find visto and veduto, which is not the case with other verbs. So this is um, an illustration that even in standard varieties such as standard Italian, we can still find um, a situation in which one verb has two post participle forms. Um, so here um, I'm just illustrating the Latin third stem uh, from which um, modern romance uh, post participles originate. This is a table taken from my supervisor's uh, uh, work that he published in 2013 um, and uh, it's sort of just an illustration um, of how post participles emerged, the romance post participles. So here I just briefly mentioned the previous studies on post participle, on the uh, post participle doublets that have been made so far and one of the most important ones I would say was uh, Michele Loporcaro's uh, uh, work published in 1998 and then also, Loporcaro worked with other researchers and he published a work in 2004 where he researched this um, phenomenon in Sicilian, Piedmontese, Neapolitan and some Lombard varieties. So we can see that in, um, in Italian dialects, this phenomenon is quite widespread, even though in standard, in standard Italian, it's not so common to find them. Um, then uh, Adam Ledgeway studied the double post participle forms in the Neapolitan dialect, but then he looked at the more um, at the phenomenon from a more syntactic point of view rather than purely morphological. What is more, um, what was done by Loporcaro and Maiden, for instance, they looked at more um, at the morphological differences between the two forms used in um, of the post participles. And then uh, more recently, um, Martina Dato studied this uh, phenomenon in the Venetian dialects. Um, well, actually in the Venetian dialects, an, an interesting phenomenon happens when um, in some of them, because there are also different uh, types of Venetian dialects, in some of them, it's not just two post participle forms used, but three. And um, there she, find out, she found out that there the distribution of each form very much correlates with the conjugation of the verb. Um, so the behavior of the uh, verbs that belong to first and third conjugation is different to the behavior of the verbs of the second conjugation. And then the more recent work is mainly Bentley and Leggio in 2014. Um, again, they studied Southern Italian dialects, which is more relevant to my research. And Bentley in 2019 published a very interesting work on the Sicilian dialects, where she actually divided them in this past participle doublets. She divided them in four classes rather than just two, uh, saying that adjectival um, past participles can be divided into further subgroups and then verbal ones into further subgroups. Um, but that was just an overview of the work done so far on this um, topic. Um, so uh, now I will go a little bit more into the work done by Thornton 2011 on the uh, standard Italian, where she studied two verbs who are no, which are known to um, have to exhibit two post participle forms um, in standard Italian, such as um, seppellire. So, for instance. Um, it has one strong form, rhizotonic one, which is sepolto, and then one uh, weak, uh, rhizotonic form, which is sepelito. 
And she found out, as we have predicted from previous work, that the strong form, the rhizotonic one, is more preferred in the adjectival context, and the weak form, sepelito, is um, preferred in the verbal ones. However, she also found out that it's not, it cannot be treated as a strict rule. So there are always exceptions. So even though there is a clear tendency towards using one in the as an adjective and the other one is more more like a verb still it's not a hundred percent rule um i will not go into the details but here for example um i cite some examples from um so that is the name of the work for instance arca persa is encountered zero times whereas arca perduta 48 times and then in the paradiso perduto paradiso perso hasn't been um, used at all. And Paradiso Perduto in, in Vece uh, was used uh, hun, um, 113 times in, instead. So distinction between um, well, past participles verbal and adjectival functions is very um, interesting because it does not seem to be a clear cut line between the two. But then for instance, Ledgeway in his work into, uh, published in 2000, um, that where he studied the Neo Neapolitan dialect said that um, the short form, so the one that is more adjectival from the pre from what we hypothesize, is um, very often encountered with the um, auxiliary essere, uh, whereas um, whereas the um, uh, the long form tends to appear with the auxiliary avere instead. Um, so I don't think I have much time left, actually. I think I will, I have too much information. Do I have five minutes left? Do I have Sorry, five you minutes? You, uh, you still have some, some eight to nine minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, so now I'm gonna draw, uh, draw a little bit more distinction between rhizotonic and irisotonic forms. Um, they, as I said before already, just to make it clear, the weak arisotonic form um, is the one where the, um, the stress is not on the root, so it's creduto from Italian credere, and then the strong rhizotonic form is uh, the one where the stress falls on the stem, so rotto from, from Italian uh, rompere. Um, and I'm not going to go into these details because I don't have much time. Uh, this is just the table that I used um, from uh, Laurent, uh, Laurent's uh, fundamental work on Romance Post Participle that um, he published in 1999. And here you can see that, um, you know, uh, Southern Italian dialects such as um, Sicilian, Catalan, Neapolitan, they uh, very much uh, behave very similarly in terms of which uh, past participle forms they use, as opposed to, for example, the Northern Italian dialects and um, French and but Spanish, for instance, it's closer to the Southern Italian dialects together with Portuguese. As I said, both Spanish and Portuguese are known to exhibit two past participle forms. It's not an, um, it's not an unusual pattern for them. Um, so my hypothesis, based on the works published by Maiden in 2013 and Lo Porcaro Pesce Ramas, published in 2004, um, is that uh, Sicilian dialects behave very similarly to Portuguese um, and Spanish. Well, they behave similarly to Spanish as opposed uh, to Portuguese, because in Portuguese we find there is a split in usage of the past participle forms between the passive and periphrastic perfect tense forms, which means that in the passive one form is preferred, and in the periphrastic perfect tense forms, such as um, um, analogically to English present perfect, the other form is used. Whereas in Spanish, the um, the uh, dividing line between the two forms, the usage of the two forms, lies along the uh, verbal adjectival axis. So my aim in this research was to find out whether Sicilian is closer to Portuguese or to Spanish in the way it divides um, the usage of the two forms. Um, so um, what people before me argued is that Sicilian is more similar to Portuguese. 
because uh, Lafauci in his work in 2000 said that there is a split between periphrastic perfect tense forms and the passive. Whereas um, other researchers such as Maiden in 2013 said that such split doesn't exist. Um, and then with his examples, for instance, um, Aviva Cucciuto u Pollo na Padedra. Here it's the example of the perfastic perfect tense form and the long uh, uh, isotonic form is used. Whereas u Pollo fu prima questo na Padedra e fu furno. So uh, here it's a passive form um, and then the short form is used instead. And this, this third sentence, arrivavo di intra e trovavo u Pollo questo. This is the predicative usage and the short form is used. So the, uh, the short form is used in the passive and in the predictive functions as opposed to the perfastic perfect tense form, which is more verbal one. So in the verbal context, the long form is used and the predicative and in the um, uh, passive, the short form is used instead. So in the more adjectival context, we find short form as in line with um, the Spanish examples. Um, so my methodology in this research was to um, use uh, my main source of data was Giuseppe Pitres Fiabe Novelle Racconti Popolare Siciliani. I used all four volumes. Um, plus I used, I studied 20th century proverbs and songs from Sicily. Um, and there I tried to find um, as many examples of the um, of different usage of the past participles. I chose 14 uh, <laughs> verbs that are known to exhibit um, the post participle doublets in the Sicilian dialects, and then I just searched for them in these works. For example, the verb aprire, to open in Sicilian, has two post participle forms the rhizotonic aperto and irisotonic graputo. And um, I just studied uh, how many times we find aperto in the predicative, in the passive, in the perfastic perfect tense um, forms, and how many times we find graputo in the same um, uh, functions. Um, I also undertook some search in the medieval Sicilian texts, uh, in which I found almost no existence of the uh, coexistence of two past participle forms. Um, I consulted El Corpus Artesia, El Corpus Ovi, El Corpus Clio, and there was almost nothing found. So I decided to just disregard that source of information because it wasn't useful. And it also makes me think even though I can't uh, say for sure that probably the development of the post participle doublets is a more recent development as opposed to being uh, there for a long time because I, it's not something I found in the medieval corpora. So uh, as I said, generally the forms that you uh, were used in the medieval text are the um, rhizotonic ones, the short ones. Um, for instance, in, uh, in the case of um, Graputo, aperto graputo. Uh, uh, aperto was found in Artesia 25 times and aperti 41 times. And then graputo wasn't found there at all. Uh, you can see the data here. I'm not going to go into details because I can't. And then here are the examples of the usage, which I'm not going to cite now. Um, but then what I found in my modern Sicilian data was um, more useful. For instance, here it's an example of the forms of vincere, vinto and vinciuto, and you can see that the examples that I found of the vinciuto's usage are much more frequent than vinto. Vinto was found just two times, whereas vinciuto it, it's just a part of it, so it's not even that, it's, it was more. Uh, but then, as you can see from this table as well, vinciuto was found exclusively in the perfect, perfastic perfect tense form, which means that it was used entirely um, in the verbal function, whereas vinto was found in the predicative and the passive usage. Again, in line with the fact that we hypothesize that the short form has more adjectival function, whereas the long form has more a verbal function. Um, sorry for that. <laughs> That's, um, so here is the overview of the data. Uh, and you can see that, again, the conclusion that I arrived to in the end um, was that the long form, the irisotonic one, is more often found in the verbal function, whereas the short form, the rhizotonic one, is more often found in the predicative and the passive functions, as you can see from this um, extract from the data collection. 
So again, here is the conclusion that I arrived to in the end of my work is that um, in the majority of modern cases, the long irisotonic form is encountered in the PPTF function more often than the short risotonic one. Whereas in the predictive function, it is the short risotonic form that tends to be favored over the long irisotonic one. And then the data for the passive function is very limited. So I'm not uh, able, I wasn't able to find much information on that. So it's not in my current ability to say where, the, where is there exists the split between passive and the PPTF. Um, but then accord, from the analysis of modern sources that I have uh, done, the pattern emerges according to which Sicilian dialects seem to condition the split along the adjectival verbal axis. Um, again, similarly to Spanish, um, so here is an overview again. I'm not going to go into this since I don't have much time. Um, and, and then, yeah, I'm just going to skip this. If you want, I can then share it with you, but I don't have much time now. Um, um, so here I'm just uh, sort of analyzing every single verb. For instance, there were some exceptions in which um, the long irisotonic form was found more often in the predicative function, but then there was um, there were very few, such as confuso, confunuto, and then here these are the ones where the exceptions were found as well, chianto, chianciuto. But then the difference between one and zero occurrences is not uh, substantial enough to predict um, a split a counter example to my claim. Then the limitations of my research uh, is that, um, is it really possible to make such generalizations uh, based exclusively on the literary sources? And then there is a very scarce presence of the passive construction um, in these sources, as I already mentioned. So again, I'm not able to say where, where, is there, where is there exists the split between the PPTF and passive. Um, uh, so there does not seem to be a straightforward correlation between the forms used in the PPTF and the one used in passive. It is one in some verbs and the other in, this, in other verbs. So in some verbs, the form used in the passive is the same as the one used in the predictive. And in other, in the other verbs, the form used in the passive is the same as the one used in the uh, periphrastic perfect tense forms. So I cannot um, see a clear pattern from this, um, from this point of view. Do I have time? Actually, actually not, I'm afraid. Okay, so that's fine. I'm just, I, I'm just gonna finish here. I just wanna say that I also performed a questionnaire where I asked some um, native speakers to translate um, some sentences to me, for me, where, um, where I tested the usage of both uh, long and short past participles. So I gave them sentences in standard Italian, whereas the, where past participle was used in predictive, perfect, perfect tense forms and passive, and I asked them to translate. And the findings of my sec of the second part of my research very much um, uh, supported the findings that I have listed so far in case of the literary sources. So. Where, so I think, in my opinion, the split between the forms in Sicilian aligns more with the Spanish um, pattern rather than with the Portuguese. So I think I should stop here. Okay. Thank you very much, Camila. We have some five minutes for, for discussion. Are there any questions or comments? Mm. I don't see any, any questions or comments. Well, then, I shall probably ask a question, which is, uh, I'm not sure it is totally related to, to your main point, but I'm wondering uh, whether uh, aperto and graputo are etymologically related. Why, uh, why do we see graputo as, uh, as the past participle of aprire? 
Uh, yes, they are. And actually, this graputo um, part, uh, gra graputo past participle, is just um, a local variation. They in some in some Sicilian dialects because they are different. It's not a uniform dialect across the island. In some of them, they insert this g in um, instead of a, and then so it's the same the same uh, stem in the end. It's just a phonological difference. Actually, it's yeah. because they are not written. Actually, it's just the pronunciation that we base our research on. Um, it's it's the same stem, but it's uh, the result of the uh, uh, influence of uh, phonology. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? I do have a question, if I may. Yes, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Camila. It was a, a, a really uh, interesting presentation. So I was wondering, you, you mentioned a comparison or you made a comparison with, uh, with Spanish for a second. Um, but uh, you know, in, in Spanish, for a given verb, you have either a, a, partic um, um, a, a, past, a participle ending in ado, ido, right? The, the regular, quote, more or less the regular form, or you have the irregular form. But for the same verb, you are never going to have two different forms, right? Uh -huh. So uh, I was wondering, in that sense, how how, how you how would you draw a, a comparison, a direct comparison between? between so actually, I, I don't remember now exactly which verbs um, have two, but I have a list of verbs that have two forms. Actually, isn't it the case? For the Spanish, no, I don't think so. Oh. Um, there was one, and it was not just one. Let me actually, if I have time, I can try to find it. Maybe um, what we have sometimes is that the participle can be used as an adjective, so it can be made uh, feminine or, or plural. Uh, it's, um, it's definitely mentioned in the work of um, Gilbert Sotelo. I think he studied the verbs that have two forms. Um, okay. And then it's also mentioned in the, uh, in the work. Can, if I have time, I will try to find it now. But I have the list of the verbs, and then it was. Um, mm. Let me see. Okay. Actually, let um, me see. Now. If someone else wants to ask a question, maybe maybe we can we can email each other later or something like that. Oh, like this. Um, I'm I'm not sure. Sorry for my pronunciation, but here it is. El vaso es leno, and then el vaso ha sido lenado. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Is it the same verb having two past participles? It is. I didn't think of that one. Huh. Okay. Yeah, so this Lleno, one. Llenado. But you can email me and I can send you the work by Gilbert Sotalo. Okay, that would be great. Thank you very much. No worries. Okay. I do not see anybody really eager to ask any question or making a comment. So probably we should we should thank our speaker for all her efforts. <laughs>